morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Carboner, and I am the president of the Walt Whitman Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission it is to celebrate New York City's literary legacy and serve as an organizing center for cultural activism and poetry-related events, just like this one you're enjoying tonight. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and tune into our YouTube channel to explore more presentations in our robust American Love speaker series. And if you like what we're doing, there are many ways to support our programs and initiatives. Please visit our website to learn out how, or you can actually write to Walt at walt at waltwhitmaninitiative.org. Uh, we decided to offer this speaker series, note the word speaker, not lecture, to present timely public facing conversation on conversations on Whitman's life, work and legacy. So with these, you'll hear uh, presentations by teachers, poets, graduate students, artists, printers, neighborhood activists, you name it. They're not designed to be purely academic talks, but free, open, informal discussions that we end by inviting your questions for Q&A with our speakers. So if you're watching now live on YouTube, please post your questions in the chat. We'll try to get to them in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the program. Um, and if you wanna know what's coming up, you can always tune in and look at our website, waltwhitmaninitiative.org or our YouTube channel. Uh, just to give you a tantalizing glimpse of what is coming up, next week we have a very interesting program. Um, Ted, I know that you're a musician. Maybe you know the name Norman Corwin or Bernard Herman. Uh, Herman, Herman was known as Hollywood's supreme film composer. He did the soundtracks for Psycho, Citizen Kane. Oh yeah, right. Yep. North by Northwest, that stuff. And it turned out that he, along with Norman Corwin, who was a genius of American radio drama, they, um, they made a 1944 radio play called Walt Whitman, which has recently been rediscovered and also wow. reissued. So the uh, post-classical ensemble has re-recorded it. And on October 9th, which is tomorrow, you can tune into the Noxos website to hear this world premiere recording of the post-classical ensemble doing the radio play Walt Whitman. And next week on Thursday, same time, same place, you can tune in and hear the folks that actually found the found the uh, the notice about it, re-recorded it. People from post classical will be here, and I will be talking to them about this really exciting discovery um, and new recording. So please join us next week for something a little bit different involving music. And the next week on October twenty second, we are very lucky to have. The, um, a historian and curator from the Library of Congress join us for a talk about the Walt Whitman materials at the Library of Congress. Some of you probably know that LC holds the largest number of Walt Whitman materials in the world. They've also been actively digitizing these collections for the use of scholars, artists, the general public, um, and Barbara Baer, will be joining us to introduce us to these magnificent collections. We'll also have writer and journalist Wally Suffup come along, who's actually worked within the collections. And we will especially take a deeper dive into the Crossing Brooklyn Ferry Notebook, an absolutely exquisite notebook, not just with that poem, lots of other things going on in there. Um, we're also going to lead the audience through an assignment that I actually gave and uh, Wally finished. And it's designed to inspire fresh insights on the poem as well as Whitman's creative process. So if you teach Whitman or if you just wanna learn more about Whitman, please tune in on October 22nd for that very special evening with Barbara Bear and Wally Suffolk. Tonight, tonight is very special. And I'm so pleased to look at my screen and see a dear friend uh, and, a, and a, a, a highly respected colleague. Ted, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, a and huge, robust pleasure, Karen. <laughs> you caught on, that's like our key phrase. 
And I'm sorry about the delay. Also, Ted, we had a bit no of problem. technical difficulties. Sorry to the audience as well. Thank you for hanging in there for us. Uh, but we are determined to forge through. We're going to give you an hour of Ted Widmer and his new book, Lincoln on the Verge, just issued this year by Simon and & Schuster and doing absolutely beautifully. Ted, welcome to the program. Thank you, Karen. Great to be with you. And I see you have some political stuff in the background there. I fully expected that. Yeah, I have some paintings by close friends and a vote poster that was just sent to me by someone I'm very close to. And um, I just stuck a thumbtack in it and put it on my wall behind where I'm sitting in, in my house in Providence, Rhode Island. So, Well, I think Walt would approve of the magnificent typography on that poster. He would. It's, you know, he, I mean, as you know very well, he was a printer among so many other things. And typography was important to him and it still is. And whatever it takes to print these ballots and get them in the mail and get them filled out and get them back to where they're supposed to go, we, we need to do that now, so. So I need to introduce you, Ted. I know you would never do it. So I'm going to step in and let everyone know just a bit uh, about you and about your accolades. And um, uh, first of all, I'll say that Ted is a member of the Whitman Initiative, a, a, a very important member of this organization that we're running. He's also a distinguished lecturer at the Macaulay Honors College of the City University of New York. He has directed research centers and libraries, including the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress, uh, centers also at, the Brown, at Brown University and Washington College. And I feel like we've got to talk a little bit about your speech writing for President Bill Clinton. That's just an amazing thing. Um, yeah, I did that. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so much more. I'm just going to say a few other things. I especially got to know Ted last year during Whitman's 200th birthday because there was just so much Whitman going on. And Ted is also a, a brilliant Whitman scholar and curator. Uh, those of you that saw the Morgan Library's Whitman ex ex exhibition last year, Walt Whitman, Bard of Democracy, uh, you were treated to Ted's expertise on Whitman and also his... A um, uh, uh, bloodhound ability to find things that I've never seen before, including an incredible copy of Leaves of Grass that I guess you discovered at Brown University that was written in by Whitman. I guess Whitman gifted it to his friend James Boyle O'Reilly, right? A Boston yeah. Whitmanite. And then I guess O'Reilly must have given that copy to Oscar Wilde, who also writes in that book. Right, it has a double inscription. And that just came into Brown very recently in the last couple of years. So I was thrilled to find it. Um, you, you mentioned Barbara Bear and she made it possible to borrow incredible things from the Library of Congress for the Morgan Show too. So. There were so many good friends, including you, who were involved in that amazing year. And it was just such a joy to meet the Whitman community. I'd been kind of a solitary Whitmanite, which is not really the best way to be a Whitmanite. It's so much more fun with other people, you know, camarados. And so you taught me how to enjoy the community. And I'm so happy to be here tonight. It would definitely not be the same without you, my friend. And I mean, you're you're making it out that you're sort of the solitary type. So I'm gonna kind of throw a curveball in and mention that you, at least on your wiki page, you talk. It's mentioned that you played guitar and sang vocals for a hard rock band, the Upper Crust, while you were in Boston. Do you want to just say a word about I that? Not, I will not deny it. <laughs> um, I had a complicated youth that went on for a very long time, well into middle age. And um, I loved rock and roll music. And grad school didn't present too many pressing work assignments for a long time. And so I just filled up the days with um, shopping for music, which I, I still 
collect a lot of vinyl, even in a post-vinyl era. And then playing, I, I was living in Boston, which, you know, it was, it's a very musical city. And it w was especially in the eighties and nineties when I was there and um, started playing little songs with friends and it, it was easy. And this is all Whitman like, it was easy to start your own band. And if no club would allow you to play, you could just stand on a street corner and play, do it yourself. And I did that for a long time. And I even had a song about Whitman in, and I'm delighted to say it's, it's unavailable. It was, it was recorded before the internet. And I don't know that there are any copies left. But it oh, was called this is another show. We've got it. We've got to unearth it was, classic. it was called Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking. Oh. And it was all right. It wasn't too bad. Um, but then out of all these little artsy bands, finally a band got together that was pretty good called The Upper Cross. And it was supposed to be just be a joke band with some costumes going on. And it just kind of hit at the right moment and people wanted something sensational and loud and different. And we became that for about two years. It, it actually threatened to end my academic career because it, there were a lot of gigs and I wasn't sure I wanted to be an academic. And I wasn't sure that I didn't want to be a glam rocker in platform shoes and a, and a, and a wig. It was pretty fun. And I did that for a long time. But then finally, I realized I really did want to teach and write. I love teaching. And um, I went back to doing that, although there was a little period in which I was a speech writer in the Clinton White House also. So, you know, I've had an unusual career. It doesn't really make any sense at all. But I think Whitman, Whitmaniacs would understand that I cared a lot about America. I cared a lot about democracy and making it better. I cared about other people's creative expression and I tried to read carefully in the works of living and dead poets and novelists and historians. And then I was trying very slowly to work out my own creative thoughts, which took a long time to figure out. But I think with this new book, I finally have gotten to where I wanna be, which is a way of writing history that has some creative qualities in, inside of it. Widmer on the Verge. Yeah. I mean, uh, you've had a career unlike any other, and I, 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 I can't even compare you to the academics that I know because you sort of, um, what does Walt say about it? In and out of the game, watching and learning from it, something like that, right? You're, yeah, you're, right. You're, you're not, you're, you're at Harvard, you're at Brown, you're at CUNY, but then you're in a rock band and you're writing for the Clinton White House. And even the, the writing that you've done has been so varied from very traditional scholarship, which I have absolutely enjoyed and benefited from greatly, to this book, which I feel is a much more populist oriented book. And I, I think you mentioned that it really took a while to give birth to this one. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit, because I, I think right now this is such a I don't know, it's important to me too, Ted, to sort of break down the ivory tower and and actually bring some of that wonderful learning and and helpful scholarship to everybody. And that's what I really feel like this book does. It's it's a magnificent read. It's a it's an actually a fluid, very easy read. Uh, but meanwhile, you're uh, I mean, you're just filling my mind with ideas, with photographs that you've unearthed from different archives. I mean, it has the feeling of a, of a, of a book that you want to take to like a beloved place and just like dive into. So congratulations. I, I feel like it really hits a, a really good place. And it, it really, to me, cements this idea of you as a, a premier public historian of our time. But I know this was not a, a predictable path. And I'm sure that there are folks that are interested in how how you did this, like especially coming from the more traditional stuff that you wrote earlier in your career. Well, thank you. That's all so um, generous of you. I re really appreciate it. 
coming from an, another public intellectual. You, you, I mean, when I first met you and we were part of the large number of organizations preparing to put on Whitman exhibits in 2019, you just radiated confidence in the public. And there was none of what I have experienced uh, at other places, a kind of um, academic snobbery. You, you just wanted to get these ideas out to everybody. And I, I love that. And, and I think Whitman stood for that too. And I've always felt the same way that why, why be snobby? These ideas are exciting and open to everyone. Um, but being a pretty traditional academic for a long time, I, I did write traditional books and it's nice of you to say you've, you've read them. They were pretty tedious. I, I wrote a, my first book was actually not so far away from Whitman. It was about New York writers, intellectuals in the 1840s and 50s who were trying to call for well, what Whitman figured out, but, but the group I studied didn't quite get there. But what would be an, a, a new kind of American literature, probably in novelistic form, that would represent the greatness of America and, and shock and amaze and delight Europeans who had not paid very much attention to, to American writers for good reason. And I was kind of working my way toward Moby Dick because these writers were saying nature was a big part of the new world and monstrousness like huge mountains and huge oceans and fossils of um, mastodons, kinds of thing Jefferson was very excited about. Big animals would be exciting to make novels around. And so they're, they're kind of laying out a blueprint for what becomes Moby Dick. And then Moby Dick is actually written by one of their most loyal disciples and they blow him off. They don't like it. Nobody really likes it. And it, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean and, and uh, literary opinion in 1851. And so my book was about a kind of exciting intellectual mo movement that then failed to recognize this incredible achievement. And Whitman was in the background of the book, but he wasn't quite Manhattan-y enough. He was still out in Brooklyn and he wasn't quite a part of these Manhattan-based conversations around, or actually around a magazine he published in the United States Magazine and Democratic Review. And you're talking about the 1840s, right? Really more the 1840s than the 1850s, yeah. Um, Which is true, these, these are his Brooklyn years. Yeah, yeah. So it was fun, but I wrote in a kind of um, constricted academic way. And besides you, maybe three people have ever- Oh, come on. <laughs> Well, I, I guess that was, uh, you know, that affected you enough that you wanted to change that, right? Because you went yeah. on to I, really- I just thought, I don't want to be an academic. It's the, the rewards are too small. The work effort is too large. And I was attracted to journalism like Whitman himself. I was a kind of freelancer. Some days I'd be more of a full-time, some days a freelancer, you know, I, I moved around from month to month, some days a musician. And it was fun, but it, it wasn't a great long-term career path. And then um, quite randomly, I, I got hired to be a speechwriter for Bill Clinton in 1997. And like Whitman moved to Washington and I didn't know anything about Washington, but I, you know, I, I, enjoyed walking around, looking at the buildings and thinking about democracy. And I, I should back up and say, I was never a great reader of Whitman's poetry. And that is how most of us get into him. It's, you know, probably the first word anyone uses to describe Whitman is a poet. But I actually fell in love with Whitman as a prose writer. I, I bought, uh, actually I have it right here. Um, there's a lovely, strange edition of Specimen Days that came out in the early 1970s from David R. Godin in Boston. I'll hold it up. 
You have mentioned it before, and I am so glad I have the same copy, and anyone listening to this show should try to unearth the copies on it's eBay. It's beautifully um, typeset. We mentioned typography. It has gorgeous typography going on. It's well illustrated, a lot of black and white photographs. And I picked it up for probably about five bucks in a used bookstore in Boston in about 1987, and it, it blew me away. The quality of his reporting, and he, you know, he is a reporter also. He's a reporter and a poet and a speaker and a mystic. He's, you know, he's all these things at the same time. And the bits about walking around Washington DC and looking at the White House by moonlight and seeing Lincoln really stayed with me for a long time. And I, I thought it was some of the most beautiful writing about the American Civil War that I had ever read. And that, that goes way back to starting grad school. But I was also attracted to the format. These are episodic little writings. Each one is about two paragraphs long. Like who, who told Whitman he could get away with that? Who said you can write a book with like 80 essays that are all two paragraphs long? It's such an innovative format. And I love that. And it was kind of like he was blogging 120 years before the internet was. That's such a great observation. Yeah. And I think, you know, that format that he uses, he was such an experimental prose writer. Oh. Uh, but Memoranda During the War is like that. I love right? that too. Yep. Um, you know, I think about some of the essays like Democratic Vistas has that feeling, right? Because he's patching together essays that he right. had previously to give it a pastiche feeling. Right. So, yeah. You get the feeling. And there is that famous photograph of Whitman near the end of his life with like 500 tiny scraps of paper on the floor in Camden. It's great. I, I relate to that. <laughs> but uh, also Lincoln made pastiches. Lincoln's beautiful speeches, which feel so finished, all of them, including the Gettysburg Address, when you really do granular archival research, you realize he's writing them on different pieces of paper and sometimes like almost, I don't think they had scotch tape, but sort of affixing them together so he can follow his train of thought from one piece of paper to the next. And there are similarities in the writing process between Lincoln and, and Whitman. And so Lincoln is also in, in specimen days and I just was always drawn to the two of them together, to the, certainly to Whitman looking at Lincoln. And then there's some evidence, st it's still imperfect that Lincoln read Whitman. Um, so I always wanted to come back to the story. And finally in 2010 and 11, so a decade ago, I had a chance when a, a freelance journal, journalism situation presented itself to me. The New York Times was thinking creatively about its online space. And now 10 years later, that is 95% of what the New York Times is, is an online place to read. But back then it was this sort of no man's land. The, the printed page was really what you read for the New York Times. And some editors wanted to do something about the Civil War. We were starting the 150th of the Civil War in 2010 and 11. And uh, they, they reached out to me. I knew them for some other reasons because I, I had written some political op-eds and they knew I was a kind of switch hitter from politics to history, including literature. So they said, could we find enough historians to write for maybe six months, maybe almost once a day on what was happening 150 years ago. And I said, absolutely. There's so many hungry young historians, including public historians, including people who aren't even in grad school. And that was important to me to get away from the snobbery and just let anyone who wanted to get in there, get in there. And so That's we started- so yeah, I, that's the beginning. That has to be the beginning of Disunion, that incredible series. That's that, how it began. Wow. And a very close friend of mine named Adam Goodhart was finishing a great book called 1861 that includes some Whitman in it. 
actually one of his first posts in the Disunion series in the New York Times was really amazing. It was a little bit of a meta essay, which helped me to understand what I was trying to do. But he talked about the experience of being in the Library of Congress, waiting for his request to be filled. And finally, someone pushes out the tray and he said he reminded him of being in a dim sum. <laughs> and it was funny, but also amazing. And then he included photographs of what he was seeing. And I began to understand you can not only is online not less than formal academic writing, it's actually more that you can put the reader right there with you as you're looking at the rare manuscript or image and explain your own delight in seeing it and, and, and convey the excellence of whatever, both of what Whitman was writing and then the, the joy of reading it and then the, the joy of the third party, the reader reading it online. And so Adam really opened up my eyes to what online writing could be. And I then- for A lot of us though, Ted, because I still remember, and you know, this is the beauty of doing a Zoom chat. Those of you that are listening in, you can just Google for Adam Goodhart's disunion piece on that Civil War notebook. And this was one of the earliest, right, that's I, what it my, was. my memory, earliest attempts to actually digitize a notebook. Now, Library of Congress has actually done it so you can page through them. But back in 2010, this was a real treat. Right. And it goes into deep analysis of the drawings that Whitman included in there, the little scraps of notes. Right. Um, and that was just the beginning of the series disunion, which is still going. Is that right? Uh, no, it ended, it, it, it was supposed to only go six months, but then it, it finally went five years. It went for the whole length of the Civil War. So it went through 2015 and I got very involved with it. I did a ton of writing for it and I, I did some editing of it. And um, two books came out of those essays and I, I was a co-editor of those books. But I must say the books, I, I'm happy they exist, but they were not as exciting as the thrill of reading the online essays. That's where the excitement was. Um, so that's where my Lincoln book began. I, I was so thrilled by what Adam was doing and a couple other writers that I felt my worldview changing and I had, you know, I'd been a conventional grad student and a conventional academic. And I realized I don't have to ask anybody for permission. I don't have to go to an academic press and hope they'll and kiss somebody's ring and hope they give me a contract that will then take eight years to complete and for which I'll be paid $45. I can just do something and money won't be a part of it and it'll just be me and the material and the, the reader out there reading it online. And so I began to follow Lincoln over the winter of 1860 to 61. And I thought I knew a lot about Lincoln. I'd read most of the major biographies, but I didn't understand how, how, how fragile America was in that winter. It's called the Great Secession Winter. Henry Adams called, called it that. And Lincoln is a very weak incoming president elect. He's, he's won with a tiny percentage of the vote, less than 40%. And the South is furious that he's won. And the North isn't that behind Abraham Lincoln. And how he maneuvers in a very tight space to build up his own coalition inside the victorious Republican party, which is filled with people who are mad at him that he won because they wanted to win. And then how he begins to turn that coalition into a genuine national government that is prepared to lead. And then how he gets to Washington over incredible adversity on this 13 day train trip, which is the subject of my book and avoids being killed, pretty, pretty important achievement to not be killed on, on his way in. And then establishes meaningful contact with millions of Americans during his 13 days out there in this wild 
open air ride on a train, seeing people in small towns and farmers coming up to the tracks and then going through huge cities in the Midwest and in some pretty Southern cities in the Midwest and some pretty Northern cities in the Midwest. And then finally getting into New York City where on February 19th, 1861, he is beheld by an enormous crowd outside of the hotel he's staying in, the Astor House, New York's best hotel uh, on a site. It's no longer there, but it was, um, the, you can still imagine it because the- The building is there, the, the um, oh, uh, probably, who knows? I haven't been there now in a few months, but this, there's a Staples there next to St. Paul's church for the, for the New Yorkers in the audience, you right. know, where the triangle of City Hall Park comes to a southern tip. Right. And on the west side of Broadway, that's where we're talking about. There's a Staples there. And it actually, the facade semi-resembles the grandeur. The, the, the footprint is still the same. And the, the Woolworth building is right next to it, right across the street. Um, but it was very important civic location across from City Hall Park. And I, I still marvel now, I, you know, I, I live in New York a lot of the time. And I marvel that City Hall Park is not a more famous tourist destination than it is because it's a very important place in New York's history. But, I, you know, think, I take my classes there all the time. I think you, you do the same, right? There's yeah. just so much to tour right there. You're right. So right. And that spot right outside of the Astor House, the former Astor House Hotel where Whitman beheld him, right? So, the first time. so Lincoln pulls up in his carriage and there's an enormous crowd and Whitman is stuck kind of in the back in an omnibus, everything is stuck in traffic and, and sees Lincoln for the first time and immortalized it throughout the rest of his life in his Lincoln lectures. And obviously something really important happened. And the way Whitman beheld Lincoln is really important to me and to my book. And I talk about it. Whit Whitman's in the book throughout the book because I talk about how Lincoln, through some um, unspoken alchemy of politics, it's hard to explain, reached young people, especially mm -hmm. a lot of young people who felt estranged from politics. Something about his rough hewn style, his body, the way he spoke, his frontier accent. Whitman calls him a Hoosier Michelangelo later in 1863. And Lincoln just cut through a lot of the, you know, the phoniness of politics. And there was a lot of that in 1860 and 61 and reached young America. I, I really like how you, and I, I wanna frame the book just a bit, just so that everybody kind of gets what you're doing because uh, speaking of the tight spaces that you mentioned before, I really love that the vision, you know, the, the actual material in the book is expansive, but you've kind of limited yourself to those 13 days of that train ride from Springfield to Washington. Um, and it reminds me a little of Adam Goodhart's idea of writing a book about one year, right? Or my friend Jim Shapiro writing his book, you know, um, The Year of Lear. But you've even taken it down to 13 days. Yes. Right? It was. Um, crucial to me because I, I would have written thousands of pages like Whitman. I like paper and I like writing and I would have just kept going. And the 13 days gave me a limit that was really good. And I, I want to mention my beloved uh, late editor, Alice Mayhew, who, who um, kicked me in the butt a lot and said, you cannot just write about every leaf that fell outside a train window that Lincoln might have seen. You know, you have to keep it going. You have to keep the train moving and keep Lincoln focused. And just every chapter has to be discreet. And that was very, very good advice. But um, it's, it's such a neat thing, because I think about the, you know, the tendency to want to list things now, you know, online, the 10 best this, you know, the five worst that and I, I guess just giving yourself a space to work within like those 13 days right. isn't is a sort of smart version of that. Yeah, I like 13 too, is a little unusual as a number. It just is the number of days he was on the train. But 
it's a time of enormous change in the country and inside Lincoln. So Lincoln is growing as a writer, much as Whitman grew throughout his life as a writer. And Lincoln is saying better and better things about America. And there is a kind of convergence. I mean, you can see certain Whitman-like things happening inside Abraham Lincoln as he's growing into the job of president. And there is a, a, an empathy between the two of them. Um, we'll never know what Lincoln thought of Whitman. It's based on some accounts after the fact. I am inclined to believe that they are true, but some scholars are skeptical. But um, one account describing Lincoln reading Leaves of Grass in his law office in Springfield, it's very funny. Taking the book home, Her Herndon had, his law partner, William Herndon had it. And Lincoln was curious, according to this account, written by a young guy in the office who, but he took about 20 years to write it out his account, named Henry Rankin. And he said, Lincoln asked to borrow it it's a crucial detail which edition of Leaves of Grass it was, and I'm not sure, but um, he brought it back the next morning and said he had barely saved it from purification by fire because <laughs> his wife saw it and didn't like the smut. And so Lincoln brought it back kind of amused by how, how nearly it had been burned when he brought it home. And then there's a great story told by another uh, eyewitness after the fact of Lincoln looking out. So we, we have these great accounts of how Lincoln looked to Whitman. There are many and they're all beautifully written. Seeing him in his carriage going by when Lincoln is out, I mean, Whitman is out walking around Washington and their eyes sort of meeting and Lincoln nodding as the carriage goes by. But Whitman also, the great reporter in Whitman noticing a faraway quality in Lincoln's eyes as if he's sort of nodding in one part of his vision. He's seeing someone and nodding to him, but in another part, he's sort of looking out somewhere distant, thinking about what he's got to do that day. It's a really beautiful bit of reporting by, by, by Whitman, but there's a story about Lincoln up on the second floor of the White House, looking out the window and seeing this guy with a lot of hair walking back and forth kind of looking up at the White House. And Lincoln says, who is that guy? It's, it's already I, a funny story. And Whitman really you know, haunted him too. I mean, according to all reports, he actually was sort of a, uh, a voyeur to, you know, just yeah. trying to see Lincoln at any given moment. So this is kind of a likely story, right? That Lincoln actually and, paid attention to and him. And as you know very well, Karen, he had trouble holding down a job in Washington. And I can't help connecting that with the fact that he's walking around all day looking at the White House. You know? <laughs> it's like, do your job. But um, Lincoln looked out and saw this guy with a lot of hair walking back and forth, looking up at the White House. And he said, who is that guy? And someone was probably, I bet, John Hay, who was a poet, Lincoln's one of his two secretaries, and said, that's Walt Whitman. And Lincoln had this great response. He paused and said, well, whoever he is, he looks like a man. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a great line? That uh, Walt would be very happy to he hear. Looks that. like a man. <laughs> so I have a fair amount on the way the two of them perceived each other. And the Morgan exhibit really helped my book. I was in the final six months of writing it. And I just dropped down very deep into Whitman. I loved the experience of preparing that exhibit and working with you, Karen, and and the great Grolier exhibit that you did with well, thank Susan Payne. But I, I didn't realize that there was an overlap with uh, the Bard of Democracy exhibition at the Morgan and the book. Uh, although now it kind of makes sense because I remember there was a highly developed section on the Civil War in that yes. exhibition. Yes. Um, I have the book right here because you were kind enough to send me a copy. I don't know with my virtual screen if, if people can see it. It looks like an invisible thing that I'm holding here. And Ted, if you don't mind, I actually wanted to read a little bit of it because we've been talking about the content of the book. Um, and it's true, you, you report. And I really love how you interweave Whitman um, 
anyone who reads this book knows that you are a Whitman scholar because you mentioned such interesting factoids about him. They're, they're interwoven through the text. So there's no big, huge part on Whitman, but you definitely get the feeling as, as it seems Lincoln did in Washington, that Walt was out there. Yes. But the biggest section, I guess, is the one you're talking about now about, you know, just the, the first sighting and so forth. And I'm on page uh, 334 here. Do you mind, Ted? I feel oh, weird, delighted. But, you know, it's such a pleasure to read these words. And I wish you, the audience could see the imagery, which is the other thing I really wanted to talk about with you, because unlike a lot of academic books, this is just a pleasure to look at. Well, thank you. That was important to me too. Like, like Whitman, I'm not a printer, but I thought a lot about the layout and I most of those illustrations came from me and it was such a pleasure to be art editor of the book as well as writer. And folks who have done research on 19th century uh, photography will recognize images that are very hard to find. Like you've got a really amazing photograph of the Astor House where the yes. hotel that Whitman was in the omnibus in front of and, and Lincoln got out. But I'm just gonna read this one passage just because uh, Ted has been mentioning Whitman's eloquence and his writing capability. And I wanted to give everybody a taste of your own Ted. So I really love this paragraph here. Uh, to a degree, they knew each other already. After his election, Lincoln had begun to appear in Whitman's dreams. There is a charming story, difficult to verify, that Lincoln knew Whitman too. According to the memoir of a former clerk, Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, brought leaves of grass to his attention in Springfield. After bringing it home, Lincoln returned the book the next day, joking that he, quote, had barely saved it from being purified in fire by the women. Yet there were telltale signs that it had registered. Every blade of grass is a study, Lincoln said to a group of Wisconsin farmers in 1855, 1859, constituting, quote, a world of study within itself. So I know you mentioned some of those details before, but I love how in the book, the impeccable research that is behind this book is not so evident because you so easily move from one subject to another and build out for us the possibility, you know, that Lincoln is actually referring to Leaves of Grass later in 1859. So- well, Thank you, Karen. That's very generous of you. I. I I've spent a lot of time reading Lincoln's speeches. I, mean, I, I was a speech writer and he, he is the best we've ever had. So I, I really wanted to read his speeches carefully, including some pretty obscure speeches from 1859, especially. And I, I saw that, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm the first person to make that observation. Uh, others, others, Whitman scholars as well as Lincoln scholars have noticed some similarity between the two, but I tried to wrap it up together in a, in a story that moved and has Lincoln moving on the train tracks toward Whitman and then Whitman following Lincoln to Washington and being a very important witness both to Lincoln's life in Washington and then, well, he, he, he was not there when he was assassinated, although Pete Doyle was there in Ford's theater and informed Whitman's lecture that he later gave about Lincoln, and described the, the night of the assassination. But um, there's some writing I found fascinating where I did feel maybe I was a little bit ahead of the curve about um, natural phenomena in Washington in the spring of 1865 when both Whitman and his young friend, John Burroughs, were seeing odd things in the sky, like strange shaped clouds. They see a little cloud above, right above Lincoln on the day he uh, is sworn into office for his second inaugural address. And um, huge uh, groups of blackbirds sitting in a tree across from the White House. And just strange natural phenomena, almost, I mean, not almost foreshadowing the the assassination itself. And then when when Whitman hears about it, he's in New York, 
but he looks up in the sky and in his notebook, he sees very strange clouds, which he compares to serpents. And there's just some strange writing going on that I found really interesting. It's like metaphysical understandings that are hard to explain in, in a rational way, but Whitman and Burroughs were clued in to some other dimension and, and seemed to almost understand that Lincoln was about to be killed. And then after he was killed, understood that something very important had happened and that it was almost like a necessary sacrifice to end the war and that it had removed the greatest American who had ever lived, but that somehow that was almost necessary in a way the ancient Greeks would have understood. <laughs> and I, I have a bit of the ancient Greeks in this book also. Um, all of what you are saying um, is a reminder of the, the work that is behind this text. And just knowing about Lincoln, uh, Whitman and Burroughs seeing those cloud formations. Um, how, how, did you, how did you research for the book? I mean, were, were you looking at archival sources? Were you also at the dim sum table there in the Library of Congress with Adam Goodhart? Uh, it sounds like you were going to a lot of primary information. I actually, um missed the chance during my year at the Library of Congress. I was right next to this incredible collection of Whitman materials and I did not do good research there that year. But later in preparation for the Morgan exhibit, I met Barbara and she kindly brought out all these incredible Whitman materials, including um, the, a manuscript version of the 18th presidency, The incredible political document from around 1856 in which Whitman seems to call for Lincoln before he knows who Lincoln is. He calls for someone with a beard to walk out of the West to rescue American politics from the shabbiness and corruption that he's seeing all around him in, in the administrations of Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan. Incredible again, sort of psychic premonition that Lincoln is coming, just like he had a psychic premonition that Lincoln was leaving. Um, Did you mention that someone was coming with a beard? Yeah, I have a brief reference to it somewhere. I, I just read through that part because I, I remembered you saying to me once that Lincoln was the first president with a beard, right? Yeah. And Maybe this ties with the youth culture thing that you were saying before, because- oh, It just was, they were fed up. It was kind of like the sixties. They'd seen it and they didn't like it. And they were really sick of the South calling all the shots of mealy mouth Northern presidents who took their orders from the South of corrupt Tammany Hall politics in New York city. They, they just were exhausted and they wanted someone to come in and make America, America. Make America, America again. You know, <laughs> that, would, that would be an even better slogan. And um, suddenly out of nowhere came this awkward looking six foot four guy without a beard when he was nominated, but suddenly with a beard, a scruffy little beard right after he is elected and then it's growing in as a fuller beard by the time he's on the train coming into Washington. And the beard seems to be a kind of armor. Like Lincoln knows it's gonna be really, really hard to save America. And the beard seems to be giving him a kind of strength. And Whitman of course has the beard all, already, but that's another way in which they are parallel to, to each, each other. Do you mind if I show everyone the photograph that you put oh, on the cover of your do. book? Yeah. So as we have been mentioning, Ted has done some wonderful research and included really remarkable imagery um, in the book and on the book. And this is the photograph that appears on the cover of the book. And for me, this is a really unfamiliar image of Lincoln. Isn't it great? Um, well, that's what I wanted for the cover because it's Lincoln in formation. He's been something. 
He's about to be something different and he's, he's changing. We know Whitman changed a lot in his life too, but he's in metamorphosis with the beard not quite full the way we're, we're used to seeing it, um, but it's definitely something. And he's thinking a lot about what he wants to say to the American people as their incoming president. Such a thoughtful photograph. Uh, the the eyes are unbelievable. You know, it's so so steady and thoughtful and soft, right? Yeah. And, and in fact, a lot of what impressed me about this photograph is the softness from his expression to his skin tone to the, even the yeah. collar of his shirt is not what I expect. Sort of a softer image of the traditional collar worn during that time. Um, it it caught me off guard. Yeah, softer collars, softer ties. Um, a lot of people would have the white starched collar sticking up. And with him, it's, it's somewhat like Whitman. It's, it's spreading out soft cloth, shoulders are relaxed. It's, it's um, something very different from what most politicians looked like at that, that moment. You include some other images that I have not seen before. And I wanted to pull up, let me see if I can do that here. Another Lincoln image that uh, was unfamiliar to me. Uh, now I've lost where it is. Sorry about that. Here we go. Right. This one is the one that you actually call Lincoln on the verge. So any, oh, yeah. let, and I, was there a reason? I mean, just, it struck me that you called it the title of the book. I wondered why this had not appeared on the cover somewhere, but was kind of, you know, nestled in one of the chapters, but maybe it's because well, he looks a little odd. <laughs> I don't he does look a little odd. Another Lincoln biographer, Harold Holzer used it for his cover. So I didn't want to, but this is uh, two days before the trip. So that's why I said Lincoln on the verge. He's just about to get on the train. So this is what he looked like when Whitman saw him. It's ab about uh, 10 days before Whitman saw him. So again, we see someone here in the process of becoming. Yes. Uh, as opposed to being, right? The, the beard is just growing in. There's, a, again, a soft and, and hopeful expression in the eyes. Yeah. So you are really dealing with, and it makes me also think about crossing Brooklyn Ferry a whole lot, right? The, the idea of the journey being um, the conversation instead of the destination. Oh, that's like, a good turn. I wish I'd used that. I didn't think of that, but that's, that's good. Um, but uh, this is the man that you are really examining closely to, um, to see uh, someone in the process of becoming great, right? Like kind He's of isolating those 13 days to show that particular process at its height, I guess. Do you mind showing that photo again? Oh, no, no, not at all. It's right here. Because it shows how hard it was for a Lincoln or a Whitman to escape the confines of Victorian sensibilities. So they have to add in that velvet curtain and rope <laughs> to sort of capture Lincoln and make him seem like he belongs in a parlor when he's so much more interesting without those things, you know? And that was part of the genius of Whitman was understanding he needed to get out of the parlor. He needed to stand outdoors if possible or, or, or in an informal shirt. And Lincoln is wrestling with some of those same strictures. Uh, the book also impresses me with the, the sort of modern depiction of this man in the process of becoming. And I get the distinct feeling that you feel like this is a story that is easy for us to relate to now, right? There's, there's so many similarities for so many of us working on this period to our political and social moment right now. Um, any notes on that, especially since you have your vote poster behind you there? <laughs> well, in, in uncanny ways, the current moment resembles the great secession winter of 1860 to 61, 
I didn't write the book with that intention. I, I just wanted to write about Lincoln and, and Whitman, but it does feel like we are falling apart again and we have lost what used to be natural to us, a, a sort of sixth sense about how democracy works. Alexis de Tocqueville talked about what he called the habits of the heart, meaning Americans are just generous to each other. They form volunteer associations. They raise money to support a neighbor whose house burns down. They're just more naturally generous to each other than people in France would have been. And we're not that way right now. We, all, all of our selfish in, instincts are very much on display, stoked by part, partisan divisions. In my opinion, stoked more by one party than the other party, but let's, let's not go there. Let's just say the whole system is pretty dysfunctional. And it was that way in 1860 and 61, as the South began to announce that it would not abide by the rules, that um, if they won the election, then the rules mattered. If they lost, they didn't matter. And they were just going to take their toys and go home and make their own country. And that wasn't how democracy worked. And Lincoln had to remind Americans from all backgrounds that we were all part of a very important compact. And that included accepting when you lose, but then trying again four years later to, to make a better argument and, and, and come back. And that was a big part of why he refused to accept secession because they were breaking the rules that had started America. And if they were allowed to get away with it, the whole meaning of America would suddenly be half as important, if not much less than half. And all of the idealism of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and the sacrifice of the soldiers and the men and women who helped to make independence possible, all of that would go out the window and America would be kind of a joke. There'd be a anti-democratic America sitting right next to the democratic America. And, and so they would kind of neutralize each other and no one in Europe or Asia or Africa would ever have to pay attention to this thought experiment. So Lincoln, to his credit, even though he was a peaceful person personally, said no. He said, no, I do not consent to the dismemberment of the United States and to the destruction of the most idealistic political experiment in our history, knowing full well that it was imperfect and slavery had been baked into it from the beginning. But I think secretly thinking about how to get rid of slavery earlier than he let on, and as we know, he did get rid of it, um, in stages and the huge step of the Emancipation Proclamation and then in his work at the end of his life to make sure that slavery would not survive the, the Civil War and it didn't. So for all the criticism that has been leveled at Lincoln for not being as anti-slavery as other politicians, he was in the perfect spot both to get elected, and if he'd been more anti-slavery, he would not have been nominated or elected. And then once elected, to then do the incredibly hard work that he did to end slavery once and for all. And how you can't call Lincoln an abolitionist or the, the greatest abolitionist in our history is, is beyond me. And if you don't wanna trust me, just read Frederick Douglass, who was in a pretty good position to know and, and later reported that on Lincoln that said, I didn't see it coming. That's how good a politician he was. He concealed his every step until he did the most amazing things anyone has ever done to end slavery. Hmm. Wow, Lincoln on the Verge, a timely and very inspiring read. Uh, Ted, I think we are closing in on our hour. We began at a I think uh, 6.15 or so. So we, we are trying to keep these to the hour and I could go on and on with you, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to carry this on on our own. But is the, are there any last words that you would like to say maybe about the, the, the message of the book or, or Lincoln himself at this time? I know I've, I've spoken with you about 
uh, the Lincoln Project, for instance, and its relation to, to Lincoln's history. Maybe that's just too much to go into here. Um, but it's but any great. yeah, any any final words about uh, something we should carry with us? Uh, for instance, is there oh. something that Lincoln wrote? that you would really recommend that we look at at this moment in time? A speech that's very important to me in the book is a short speech he gave in Independence Hall in Philadelphia in which he foreshadows the Gettysburg Address and he, he's overwhelmed with emotion in a way that you can imagine Whitman going in there a little bit sentimental about what America means. And he says, I have never had a feeling politically that did not come from the Declaration of Independence. And feeling is a good word. It's not like a rational thought. It's a feeling. It's an emotion about what America means. And I love that. And I, I love how they both kept reading and going deeper and deeper, including into books that were not American, like the King James Bible or Homer's Odyssey, which they both liked, or um, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, a book about being a pilgrim in a sinful land and trying to get to a, a destination that symbolizes rebirth. And, and Washington is not exactly what you would call a place of spiritual cleansing, but Lincoln, by going there, did kind of achieve this amazing thing, which Whitman also achieved in his own way of a kind of spiritual cleansing, um, both personally, and they're both pretty temperate people. Lincoln is a teetotal, I mean, they're both, and Lincoln, I mean, Whitman swears off spirits for the Civil War, um, but then through the act of constantly writing and improving and putting their pieces of paper together in these pastiches, as, as you said, and never surrendering, um, never giving up on the idealism of America, but also being these sharp-eyed, one's a Brooklynite, the other's a, a, a Hoosier Michelangelo, these sharp-eyed, pragmatic Americans who can drive a hard bargain if need be. They know the value of something, but they're merging realism and idealism in, in the perfect quantities and renewing America at a very dark moment and giving the rest of us a chance to also share in this incredible national story. Wow, heartening words and lives that are worth examining, particularly right now. Ted Widmer, thank you so much for being here and for imparting this wisdom. For those of you listening, please check out his book, Lincoln on the Verge, just out, as I said, at, with Simon & Schuster. It's a beautiful book, Ted. Congratulations on the many positive reviews. And, um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Karen. Always great to talk to you. All right, folks. We'll see you next Thursday.